Because he said, all these rituals, what for? What for? What do they benefit him? For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? And he came back to fight against the rituals and fight for humanity, fight for life, fight for respect, fight for kindness, fight for understanding. That's what he did. And they made a Catholic out of him. <laughs> he was universal. He was beyond religion. He was beyond religion. He came to fight against religion of his time. Because it was so stuck in the book that you can't heal a person on the Sabbath. What? It is more important to see a person suffer than help them because it's a ritual? <laughs> Will a mother do that to her child? Will a father do that to her child? If your, father, your child calls you on a Sunday and says, Mom, I need help, I'm in trouble, will you walk away? Unless you're mad or totally on drugs, <laughs> then you're a disturbed mother. But most mothers wouldn't, most fathers would. Hmm? It's only the ones that are disturbed. And it is up to us, the ones that have energy, that are stu studying this, to really be very, very focused. Focus, 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 in which is, what Sri Patanjali tells us, if we learn to focus, dharana, concentrate, balance, focus, 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 what will happen in your life? Many things are going to happen. Hundreds. You'll get sick. People will hurt you. People will rob from you. Your best friends will hurt you. Your family will deny you. Everything will happen. But if you focus, that that's all oh, temporary, and just focus on what? What do you focus on? Peace. 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 But what do we do again and again and again and again? Because we're human. It's part of the play. It's part of the fun. It's part of who we are. We came here to play. So let's play instead of getting so serious. What do we keep doing? Somebody keeps telling tells us something. We allow our peace to get disturbed. We allow it like this, we give it away like this for a few pennies. Our time is much more precious. Your time on earth is so very precious, you know. So very precious, so very important. Think high. That's a simple living, high thinking. Master Chinmayananda. Simple living, high thinking. Keep your brain up. Keep your brain in an almost super normal standard. You know what I loved about Swami Chinmayananda when he talked? He says, you know, we were born to be supermen and superwomen. And you know what? We gave it away for a bit of money, a bit of attention, a bit of importance, a bit of this. We, give, we gave it away. Hello, Church. It's been a long time I haven't seen you. Sorry, I'm you are not late. No, you're never late. You're always in the right place. You know what she's going through right now. Everything is threatened. And where is she going to get a job now? She's a granny. <laughs> a super granny. <laughs> there two of us. She may have quite supreme joy. Yeah. No, no. Did you hear that? Did you hear what he just said? They have supreme joy. Why, as Sri Patanjali says, by the practice of contentment, supreme joy. You let the Harry on, You know, you are quite something, Thomas. You are quite something. And that is exactly the truth, because they are content, they have supreme joy. 
And uh, it takes us grown-ups a long time to learn that truth. Remember to keep it for the rest of your life. Don't get grown up and forget it. Because hmm? <laughs> <laughs> all of us as children knew that. All of us as children knew that. And then we grew up and life took us over. You know, we didn't let the child in us, the child, uh, must, again, today Master Chimayananda must be listening. He used to say, it's good to be child. <clears throat> I think that was a confirmation. <laughs> it's good to be <laughs> childlike, not childish. Good to be childlike. We should always be like a child, but don't be childish. And this is how we need to live our life. And this is why the run is so important. And this is why you're studying this course. It doesn't matter to me, really, but it will make a great difference to you in your life. It matters to me because I, the only way it matters to me is because I see you all such incredible individuals. Maybe you haven't seen your own light. Uh, life has not been so kind. But when I see you grow in light and when you overcome all these hardships. Do you know, it's something that happens to you that will influence a lot of other people. What you go through with love and acceptance, you know, and I'm not saying you won't face battles, you will always face battles. That's the next text, the Bhagavad Gita. You will always face battles. Till the day you die, you will face a battle. You will always have decisions to make because we're human. And each time as you grow, they'll be more intense and more difficult. Each time testing you, do you really believe, do you really believe that you are immortal? Do you really believe that life on earth is temporary? And there are really higher things to do here, you know? Uh, we have, all of us, come with some destiny, all of us. We cannot escape that. Now, how do you want to use your destiny? You know, some things are going to happen to us. The only thing we can change is how we approach it. How we approach it. We can change nothing else. Some things are calm. Others become worse because we fall into karma and we feel sorry for ourselves. So, I'm not saying you shouldn't feel sorry for yourself. It's normal. Once in a while, have a good cry. But like a child, when they fall and they scream, Mommy, Mommy, and then you put a band-aid, give them a little attention, they're up again and running. You go, oh my God, that was quick. <laughs> and that's how we should be. You know, when we fall, we give a good cry and say, you know, my father, actually told me such a wonderful thing when I was going through a really difficult time. He said to me, you know, Melanie, fight with God. Go scream at God. I think it's about time. <laughs> so that's what I did. And guess what? God answered. That's why I know, ask and you shall be given. Knock and you shall, be, you shall find. Seek and it will come to you. I did. I said, if there is a God, you're going to show your face. And I always tell this story. Two days later, phone call from my master. I am visiting Zurich. Can I visit you for the peace conference? Can I come to Gibraltar? Hadn't heard from him for 15 years. And, you know, phone call comes at a time when I'm fighting. But what am I fighting for? Justice, truth. Hmm? And, and then the way forward. How to, find, how to find that justice and truth in the world that is full of violence, of untruthfulness, of greed. How to find it? And the secret is to keep your world as pure as you can. And that's why Sri Patanjali tells us, when you cultivate it, when you practice the eight limbs of yoga, you will know exactly what to stay away from, discriminative discernment, and what to be with. And what I always say to people, it's only one thing. Make it so simple. Stick with peace. Make it simple. The mind will give you a million debates and a million arguments and a million things to talk about. But stick to simple. Peace. Make peace your God. So that's dharana. That's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about dharana, which is concentrate on one thing. Now many people, when they start to do meditation, Oh, I need to meditate. So they sit there and they try to meditate. But of course, if your mind is in a state of worried about this and worried about this and I've got this function and I've got that, you're never going to be in a state of concentration. You can't. It's not possible. How are you going to meditate? So, you know, these masters are really wise. It tells us, choose an object, 
Choose a mantra. Choose whatever you like. Sri Patanjali is wonderful. I love him. He says, choose, well, when I'm gone, they'll be teaching you this. Choose something that elevates you. Whatever you want. If you don't believe in a God, and you don't believe in a force, you don't believe in a light, choose anything you want that elevates you. What elevates <coughs> your heart? What makes you sing? What makes you love? What makes you laugh? Go there first and focus on that. And focus on that. Why do you focus on what makes you sing? What makes you love? What makes you laugh? Because sometimes God is so remote. It's such a remote idea. And nowadays with all the languages spoiling the real meaning of God, you know, my master said, God or dog? Turn it around and it's dog. Mm -hmm. To live well, turn live around, and it's evil. The choice is ours. The two are in one. Do you see? Sometimes all this is so remote. So how do you make yourself focus and concentrate? Because there will all be doubts. Is there a God? Is there this? Is there this? Is there? You know, the early stages are always that. And when you're really crying and there's no answer, you say, you know what? There's nothing out there. There will come a time when you will say that. But you really know there is something. Even though you're saying it, you know there's something so deep, so wonderful. So you're just angry. And that's why you say there's nothing out there. There is. So how do you find it? And again, in the Upanishads, it says again and again and again, you know what they call God, which I love, the Lord of love. The Lord of love. No larger than the thumb. No larger than your thumb. It is in the hearts of all. In the hearts of all. Deep in the hearts of all is the light of all lights, <coughs> Bhagavad Gita. All the different tradition talks Inside of us. Inside of us. So, where can you feel it? When you're in love, where do you feel it? In your heart. When, when you're not in love and you're in pain, where do you feel it? In your heart. And when you're in pain, when you're not in love, it's a horrible place to be, isn't it? So, you need to love again. You need to love. Love <laughs> makes us young. Love anything. So, if you can't you know, God's not listening to, it's too remote, then start to love something, love the flowers, love the earth, love the grass. If you can't do human beings, love those things, love animals. You know, how many people here give their lives for animals? We got here, Mary used to, when she came 20 years ago, she was telling me the other day, I met her, and she was saying, she just used to pick up all the animals from the street. Because in those days, nobody used to care about the animals here. And they used to run them down. And what did she do? One by one, pick them up and look after them. That's love. And when you start to love like that, because you love, and you know the heart chakra, when you love, what do you use? <coughs> Your arms, <coughs> isn't it? To pick, to save. And it's always someone, another soul, or another animal, or another life. When you're saving another soul, another animal, another life, makes you really holy inside. You feel whole. <coughs> and for that moment, you forget yourself. You really forget yourself. Because you're picking, you're loving, you're saving. And that makes you feel whole. Because that something happens in your energy field that takes you to another dimension. And that takes you closer to God. Because while you're picking, and you're saving, and you're holding someone in pain, you are being held. You are being held. I always, the other day I was, uh, oh, a few, few years ago, actually I was massaging somebody's hand, my granddaughter's hand, oil, right? My hands are always very dry. As I wash dishes. <laughs> Isn't it great? <laughs> so, I was to Hong Kong, you know, my sisters, you manicured hands, and I don't know what happened to me, you know? But you know what? I like them. Dry and ugly. Quite nice. And, uh, <laughs> hard work. It shows hard work, you know? And uh, so what happens is, uh, I was massaging uh, my granddaughter's hand like this, and as I was much massaging granny, I really love it. And then I looked at my own hand, and as I was massaging her, when I finished, I go, you know what, I was massaging you, but really I was massaging myself because, you know, Tara, look at my hand, how soft it is now. It's not so dry. Isn't that true? Yeah. 
when you massage somebody's feet, the same thing. You're doing something for someone, but more is coming back your way. And the joy of service, the joy of, of doing it to make somebody happy or light makes you feel whole. So when you concentrate, try to bring this wonderful feeling of love in your heart first. Make God real in your heart by love, by love. You know, that's why, um, you know, in all the great Hindu scriptures, it's like, service to the Guru brings the highest joy. Service to the Guru brings the highest joy. There is no joy higher than that. And that service is the guru within you, the light within you. If you don't have a guru without, I was very fortunate to have a guru without. So for me, it could focus on service to the guru. What was, how could I serve the guru? By trying to live the best I can, trying to live yama niyama, living the eight limbs of yoga. At least he would say, at least one disciple followed it. <laughs> That was my, my work. I wanted to thank him by working on what he taught me. What he taught me so I could spread the teachings. And what, it, what is a guru? Remover of darkness. So that guru lives within all of us. We've just got dark and we need to get light. So if you start thinking about all these things, when you go home and you write, keep a diary like I tell you, constantly swadhyaya. What is swadhyaya? Study on spiritual books. Terrible students. Horrendous. <laughs> Swadhyaya, say it with me. Swadhyaya. Study of spiritual books. Why? Elevate the mind. Elevate the mind. You pick up a book. What do you need? Just glasses and hands. Always. You know, you always look for things that are right next to you, like our soul. That's right. We're lost and we're looking somewhere else. You know? <laughs> Maybe you look for a candle and it's the other way. Yeah, many times it's happened. Many times. So, you, like I said, you pick up a page. Okay, and look what I see here. This is about the divine. The yoga vision of the cosmic form. This is the Gita. This is not the Gita. The whole universe trembles, almighty Lord, on seeing your infinite strength and in the presence of your awesome form of countless eyes that see everything and infinite arms and legs and bodies. And Lord, I am shaking, seeing like you, you like this, taller than the sky, taller than the sky. I've lost my courage and peace. <laughs> He's having a vision of the divine and he's not yet ready to have the vision of the divine he's not yet ready right so when he sees that you know we say that he was used to one god one way lord krishna and all of a sudden there was he saw countless eyes countless mouths countless beings and it was too much it was too much and then lord krishna took the vision back you see this is why this is why we can't see everything because it might be too much for us. That's why we're not given all these visions all at once and all the knowledge all at once. It's too much. We may not be ready. We may not be ready. And we need to be ready. And like my master said, practice yama, niyama, and the eight limbs of yoga. <laughs> then when you are ready, you will be. God will use you. You'll be safe. And when you are ready, Kundalini itself will rise up. But of course, when Kundalini rises up and the energy force rises up, it's going to cause a lot of disturbance. Hmm? Anything. You know, when you um, have gastroenteritis or you have, um, you know, food poisoning, because of the poison, when it rises up, you have to throw up, right? It's going to create a disturbance. It's going to create cramps. So, so spiritually, as you elevate, lots of things in you might move. You might suddenly develop anger overnight. You go, oh my God, I work so hard, and I'm suddenly angry. Or you might suddenly develop fears. But I was fine yesterday. Last week, I was so much at peace, so strong. What happened to me this week? What happened? I lost my peace. I lost everything. This is natural on this path. It's 
a lot of energy is shifting up. That's good. You're going slowly, not too quick. And don't be frightened of these changes. They will pass. You have to vomit them up. You have to see your awful anger in front of your face, your awful impatience in front of your face, your awful <coughs> fear in front of your face before you can look at it in the face and say, you know what? I can't be bothered with you. Know? And drop it. Like that. So you're being trained to watch the ugly part of you and drop it. Once the ugly part of you is gone, then what's left is much nicer. So of course all this purging happens, and a lot of it's happening in our world at the moment, because there are a lot of changes in our world at the moment, which is wonderful times. As Charles Dickens said, we are living in the best of times and the worst of times. Aren't we lucky? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one we're going to is Pratyahara. Can somebody read it please, loud? 54. Yes, please. When the, sense would, when the senses withdraw themselves from the objects and imitate, Im, yeah, and imitate as if they were the nature of mind stuff, this is pratyahara. Okay, now what do you know of pratyahara? What does it mean? What does it mean? Sense control. Sense control. What are your senses? Okay, so you all know your senses? Okay. What happens with your senses? We read in Sutra 2, Yoga Sutta Priti Narodha. You smell something, mmm, chocolate. And then you go there and you go, unless I have this chocolate, I won't be happy, right? And you eat the chocolate, and you go, oh, why did I have that chocolate? And then you go, I don't want another one. Not good for me. But the senses will take you, and you have two, three, four, five, six. Before you know it, you finish the box. And you've enjoyed it, and then you've hated yourself. Afterwards, you feel sick, you feel horrible, you feel you've lost all control. Correct or incorrect? This happens with our senses in every direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sense control is withdrawal of the senses because what our senses it's like our eyes are like cameras right our ears are like receivers you know our mouths create to taste all the lovely things and also for speech also for speech and we talked about speech and truthfulness and how should we speak we should always speak the truth but we should speak it in a beneficial way and we should speak it peacefully. And nowadays, oh, but I told the truth, and you tell the truth so rudely. Do you think that's telling the truth, or that's being judgmental? Because if you tell the truth, you will not speak with that voice. You see, the truth, you speak it gently. You know what? This wasn't very nice. You hurt my feelings. That's the truth. But you need to do this, and you need to do that. Not the truth. That's judgment. You have to learn the difference. Learn the difference and speak with that voice. So that's our mouth and our hands. Feel, touch, create, make beautiful things. All these senses are given to us to use for the highest. The highest good. But what's happened? Weakness sets in. Ego sets in. Remember what is ego in Sutra 2? Ahamkara. Hmm? Do you remember? Ahamkara. Manas and Bodhi. You remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we have to have a really deep revision again. <laughs> and so, you know, the ego sets in and the ego wants to take. I should I deserve this. Why should any I work so hard, why should somebody else reap my benefits? I did this, and the other person got the praise. What, did you see the ego is always fighting with us, and always trying to prove itself. And then what happens, we use, because the ego takes control, we use this, the senses to feed ourselves. So then what happens? Instead of loving, we get angry. Instead of speaking sweet words, we speak angry ones. Instead of seeing things that will make us elevated, 
we will start seeing all the dark and ugly things. Hmm? Instead of listening to nice music and enjoying your life and hearing nice stories, you will listen to all the gossip and let your head go. So you see, the senses are there for us to enjoy the highest good, the highest life can give us, the delicious food, you know, the beautiful nature, beautiful people. Hmm? But it needs to be controlled. And he says here that when you learn to bring your senses inward, and here it's very fancy language, from the objects and imitate, as it were, the nature of the mind stuff. So what he's saying is, you know, like a tortoise, you see a tortoise or a turtle? And what happens in the Bhagavad Gita it describes it like this, bringing in your senses. Imagine a turtle when it's going to be attacked, what happens? All the senses goes in, it becomes like a rock. All the soft bits are inside. You actually develop an armor. And we call this an armor of light. And I like to call it, to each one should be a warrior of light. Each one of us should be a warrior. What we do is when we get attacked, you bring in your senses. And you don't, when an attack hits you, it bounces right off you. Because you go inside and follow your inner light, the guru within, the love within, the goodness within. You bring it in. So it bounces off you. Now, what happens? If something hits you and you allow the senses to be outside, then the ego will take over. I don't deserve it. Oh, you're good for nothing. Oh, this. Oh, this. You know, all your internal emotional feelings will come out. So withdraw. Learn to withdraw your senses. You know, I told most of my students in the early days, you practice with physical things first because emotions are very difficult to withdraw, harder. So first of all, when you want to practice using your senses, use physical things that cause a little disturbance to you. I remember in those early days, you know, I, 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 when I practice Pratyahara, I give you my examples, they're a little silly, but they are there. <laughs> every day, I used to have a bar of chocolate, every day. One bar of Cadbury's there. I don't know why I was skinny then, now I don't have it and I'm bigger. <laughs> Part of that's life. <laughs> so anyway, I used to have a bar of chocolate every day, which I knew wasn't good for my chest. Being an asthmatic, it pre pre creates new kids. But it was kind of like addiction. So. And I loved it. and made me really, really happy, you know. So one day I said, you know, I told my husband, I think, don't buy me any more dairy milks. I'm going to try and put your I want to start learning physically. If I can't even do chocolate, what am I going to do? You know, how am I going to do the emotional stuff? So, but I learned that if you rip something out from my previous mm -hmm. learning with psychology, etc., when you force something away too quickly, it bites back at you, right? So I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my mind that I will not have chocolate Monday to Friday, but Saturday will be my chocolate day. So in the beginning, oh, Saturday comes, Saturday comes, Saturday comes. You all know this feeling. It's Saturday, chocolate day, boom, 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 boom. Eat the whole bar. And it made me feel good. And after, actually, after not having it for five days, when you taste the first bite, it's really not so delicious anymore, is it? You got used to not having it. You got used to not. But because of mind, habit, you force yourself to have the second piece because you don't believe that the mouth has told you it's not so delicious anymore. You don't want to lose that attachment to that deliciousness. Hmm. Do you see? We're attached to that deliciousness. So we'll have the second piece, and that's dangerous. <coughs> hmm? So what happens? I did that practice, and then finally I would go, okay, I won't do it for another month, or another two months, and then once I didn't do it for a year, and now I enjoy everyday chocolate. I can have one cube. That's enough. It's enough. And the days when I don't need it, I don't need it. And I love that one cube of chocolate with my boiling hot water. It's so delicious. I dip it and melt it. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the absolute truth. I love doing You're really that. selling it well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll get some chocolate, please. <laughs> you see, last night I had the one piece. I won't have all the fancy chocolates. I don't like those. Just stick to what I like and just have one. 
And you, for me, that one piece of chocolate is what the senses were meant to, that's the earth that we were meant to enjoy, because that one doesn't make you feel bad later. It makes you feel so happy, and it's balanced. It's when you overdo. But before you can come back to, before I could come back to eating that one piece of chocolate, and that's enough, I had to learn sense control. So for many years, not one year, many years, I was very, very hard on myself. I gave up many things, many things, one <coughs> by one. You know, I would get, I'm not having this for one year. I'm not having this for two years. And I did that practice. And I suggest to all of you, you try to practice. Another thing was I was totally addicted to reading. Totally addicted to reading. You know, now I don't even have time to read. <laughs> But, uh, and it doesn't really matter so much, because now you read life, and you read people, and you read, you know, so many other things to read every single day, you know. I was totally addicted to books, 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 books. Oh, I see a bookshop. Many of you feel this way too, right? <laughs> oh, I'm having so many books. What are you going to do with so many books? And I used to gobble them up. And then one day I said, too attached to these books that are sitting in my library, 300 getting or 400 get, gathering dust. Came a voice in my head, give it away. <laughs> Non-attachment. <laughs> right? Prachahara is also a practice of also not being so attached to things, right? So you have to work on it both ways. One is stopping and the other way is giving what you love. So of course, I was determined, and the first time I gave my favorite book away, my favorite book, which I had for years, called One Reality, and um, and you couldn't find it again, I gave it like this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it interesting? And now, give any book away. What if you have it? No big deal. No big deal. It's a book. It's just a book. When I die, there's all those books there, you know? I only keep books in case sometimes when I feel people are in need and uh, we can't get an edition or it's lost. Like I had some really old books from India you can't get again. And uh, sometimes I wish I was a little bit more discriminative rather than do it the other way, give it all the way. I should have kept those that are really difficult to find so I could share it with others because those people that I lent it to don't share it. They just keep keep it and they don't share it with others. At least with me, I can share it with everyone. So I've learned to be a little discriminative now. You see discriminative discern. First I have to give it all away and learn that yes, I give it all away, but maybe to the wrong hands. <coughs> and I know one person who's got so many of my books and it just stays on her bookshelf and she won't share it with anyone. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> no, okay. Don't say. No. So, you know, and then I go, and I tell the person, no, I haven't finished. How many years now? You ever finish? I laugh. I find it funny. You know, I really find it funny. But then I learn discriminative discernment. And every time I tell that person that, she looks at me and she knows it's her addiction with books. So it's her battle now. You know, go share it. That's probably share. where all the books I donated went as well. Then. <laughs> probably. I donated so many to the library. I was thinking the other day. And Ole and Kim too, so many they donated here. And uh, Dora too, so many. She bought me three bags. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, this yeah. is, so these are the, you know, I'm just giving you examples. Uh, everybody is addicted to different things. Everybody has different addictions. And I always advise you, Start withdrawing from the physical first. When you can handle that which is in your hands, then the emotional becomes easier. Your mind gets stronger. You see that your mind gets much, much, much stronger. In the early days when I used to teach, I used to have fast with all my students. Say one week so fast. Remember the old days? We all went to have a fast. By the third day, many of them never fasted before. But soup, vegetable soup, it wasn't like you were totally without food. No, I mean, my mind, I need food, I need food, I need food. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not, you're fine. By the fifth day, everybody was so much better. 
that they had conquered their minds. But the amount of phone calls I got on the third, second and third day, they thought they were going to die. You know? <laughs> they didn't. That was the amazing thing. And they went through this wonderful process. Another thing I used to do with my students, I'm getting old, I was young, I was 40, you know, 39, 40, could do those things and wanted to do those things, is go up early in the morning. I can't get up at half past five to go to the beach and meditate by six. You want to be a teacher trainer? You come with me to the beach at six o'clock. And they would all come at six o'clock and then train their minds. You know, get up at six in the dark, go to the beach, and all the bugs are there, the floor's cold. And by the time you open your eyes, you watch the dawn. You know, you do that, so you know. So that's, that's what you get, you know. Sense control, practice. These are the things that make you richer inside. What you don't like, learn to like. That was his message to me. Now, me, what you don't like, learn to like. And nothing in extreme, always in balance. So this is what it's saying. When you withdraw your senses inwards, and even if the chocolate is there, or whatever you like is there, you look at it, and you don't need to have it. You enjoy it for what it is. You don't need to, if you see somebody with a beautiful dress, or a beautiful home, or a beautiful car, or a beautiful suit, or fancy computer, you don't need to have it. You just enjoy somebody else having it. You get so happy. We'll come to the four locks and keys. And by Pratyahara, Pratyahara, you develop a lot of detachment naturally, naturally. And uh, that actually makes you appreciate everything much more. Hmm? And enjoy. And again and again, our master says, if you feast every single day, have so much delicious food every day. But what happened? <coughs> By the eighth or ninth day, you said, you know what? I don't want any more. Haven't you been on holiday where you eat and eat, just yeah. longing to go home for simple food? Oh, God, give me Rivita and Lentea. Lentea. you know. <laughs> delicious, what? Okay, no, well, give me something you know, boiled broccoli, because you're so tired of all those rich tastes. <laughs> mashed potato. Uh, mashed potato. Mashed potato. Mashed potato. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's delicious. It's delicious. So you see what I'm saying? It's exactly like that. If we freeze on things every day, we actually get quite sick of them. Our life becomes poor. You know? And the people who have so many problems are the people who are allowed to feast every single day. And they have everything, you know? And they have nothing. I remember a lawyer in Marbella told me, you know, once I was talking to her, and she said, you know, when Sometimes I really don't like my job, and I said, why? She said, you know, so many rich people come and they say they come to retire here. I don't know why they retire. They say they'll play golf every single day. You know what happens? They pay, play for three or four months. Because these people are all people who've worked in the world, and they've been busy. Suddenly, they're not busy. Suddenly, now look at her, there's a lawyer, not studied yoga. They're not useful. So what do they do? They find problems. Mm -hmm. They argue with a neighbor. They find problems with a neighbor. They want to take this one to court. They fight with this one, and they argue with this one. And in the end, they got court cases, and then they're not only that, they develop illnesses. They develop illnesses, and if there's one thing small, normally you'll say, oh, forget it. Oh, there's a pain in the ankle. Maybe they've got cancer. And then they think they got cancer. So they want to see all the best doctors. They call me all the day. This doctor didn't give me the right diagnosis because they didn't want that diagnosis. They were looking for the cancer diagnosis, you see. Is it scary what people do to the minds? And she goes, so sad. I'm going to work. If I leave work, I'm going to do travel, safari. I'll go all over the world and work and meditate and do that when I retire. Don't ever retire just to play golf unless you're an expert in golf and you plan to make it a career. Because we need to feel useful. We all need to feel useful. But just remember the three things you have to remember. Why are you practicing yoga to leave what? Memorize that. Easeful, 
peaceful and useful. Useful is so important. For me, it's the key. You know, don't you feel sad when nobody needs you? <laughs> it's a bit sad, isn't it? Nobody needs you. I see people bring out their best potential over and over and over again when they're needed. They bring out the best in them. It's like, wow, there comes the goddess or the god in them. Wow, they just really stand up for that. You know, Nuria, we saw you do that when your sister was so, so sick. You know, who just stood up like a goddess of strength and took over the whole family. We saw Chandra when she lost her husband. Just took over. You know, this is what yoga should do to us. We bring the goddess of God out in us, that guru within, that light within. How is God going to express God if not in a tool? We are just tools, don't you know? And when we go through our problems, he's calling. Are you going to stand up to this test or are you going to fall apart? This is your tool. And why will you fall apart? Because you're thinking, I, me, me, it's why me, why me, why me, why not you, why not you? Today somebody came to see me who was in such great problems, you know. And of course you feel the pain when you're in a great problem. And that's fine. It's good to cry. It's good to fa face the pain. But at the same time this person said to me, you know, I don't mind doing this because I know there are people so much worse than me. I'm like, oh, I just wanted to give that person a hug. Because recognizing your pain and also know it's for not the worst it could be. It gives you some kind of, you know, it gives you some kind of strength. You're not that far down that you can't be pulled up again. Hmm? And of course you respect, but you have to go through pain. We all have to go through it. It's not going to go away. Please accept that. So you have to go through the process of pain. It's how you go through it. And yes, you're going to cry sometimes. And yes, you're going to panic sometimes. But if you keep your mind on that, take the senses from the outside world, don't look at what other people got, just go in and look at the light within by the, protect, the practice of contentment, supreme joy is gained. And go into that practice. So that is <laughs> Then, look at 55. Once you learn to withdraw the senses, which is, no more. I have to have this in order to be happy. I have to have so much money in order to find my peace. If I had this, this would, would, would be fine. I know if this came to my life, all will be fine. No more, no more, no more. What you will say is, my life is fine already. It would be nice to have this, but you know what? I am fine already. It would be great to have. Why not? You can have everything you want. But the desire no longer controls you. You control the desire. You control that. And that gives you peace. And that gives you quiet. The quiet in the mind. Because noise comes only if you listen. And I did this practice for a long time. Only time my mind was upset is when I desire something. Notice. And then you make it, but I really need it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the practice is, I have everything I need. And the practice that I used to do is, I'm so lucky to have a plate of food, a warm bed. I'm so lucky to have a plate of food, a warm bed, a nice hot bath. Wow, what luxury. <coughs> and just that was the practice. Just zone into what you do have. So these desires are not making me happy. Look at them. So why would I want it? But it takes a long time to purge up those desires. And I used to pray a lot, you know. Lord, grant me the tranquility to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Just repeat it and repeat it and really ask. And nothing that I've always asked for, and still to this day, this is one prayer I make solidly every day. And I ask of my master. There is only one boon I ask of you. One thing. To meditate on you constantly. It's a song, actually, that they made up in the ashram. 
and there's, there's only one rule I ask of you to meditate on you constantly. Meaning the guru within, and that's what I keep asking every day without fail. Only one thing. Because everything is as it is. Sometimes there are no answers. I remember my son asked me, Mom, what's the point of life? Why did Dad go so young, so suddenly? Mom, what's the point of life? I did. What is the point of life? Why? I told him, I can't tell you why. All I can tell you is it is as it is. When we would say, why, but this, if we torture ourselves, it is as it is. But one point is for sure. The point of your father is he left you with so much love. He had a good dad. He left us with so much love. He had a good dad. He had a good father. How many people don't have a father for so many years? At least you're 30. He passed away when you're 30. Good 30 years with your dad. The point is you turn out to be a great human being. I see him in you. That's the point. Job done, finish, it is as it is. Every time you do a boy, you get that pain. So remember what dad said in this? You know what our mantra was in the last few days, every time we looked at each other and we felt like, oh, he just said, you know what? It is as it is. Hmm? It is as it is, you know. You went through it. Can you do all the questions just torture you year after year, day after day? <coughs> For what? You can't, you're no good in this world when you're tortured. Is anybody good in this world or useful when your mind is tortured? None of us are useful. So who's torturing it? Their answers sometimes we're never going to get those answers. I can't tell you. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Things happen. Everybody dies. That's all I know. Everybody has their time in life. And you just move on. And time heals all. And then you learn, you learn, you grow up. And I'd just like to read to you what Gurudev says here about Pratyahara. If the senses are allowed to see outside, they try to grasp pictures of the outside world. If they are turned inward, they will see the purity of the mind and won't take on the color of the world outside. The senses are like a mirror. Turned inwards, they reflect the outside. They reflect the outside. Sorry, turned inward, they reflect the pure light. By themselves, the senses are innocent. But when allowed to turn outside, they attract everything and transfer those messages to the mind, making the mind restless. Turned inward, they find peace by taking the form of the mind itself. The senses are, in effect, a gateway that allows externals to come into the mind. For example, if we look at a cabinet, we can only understand it as a cabinet if our mind takes that form. This is the law of perception. That's why when we concentrate on something holy, the mind takes that form. When the mind retains it, we get those pictures even in our dreams. When we have sense control, we only allow the mind to take the forms we want. That is our gift of free choice. Isn't it wonderful? It's our gift of freedom. So when the mind does this chitta chatta chitta chatta, the chitta chat is all to do with the outside world. So if you start focusing on the holy name inside, 
Go chit chat chat chat, that's why we we'll use mantra. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Shiva 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 Shivaya Yam Namo Hara 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Shiva 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 Yamaho Hara 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 Om Namah Shivaya 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 on the form of the mantra and then when you do trotak which is meditating with your eyes open what happens is you see the object and you stare 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 like if you stare this yantra stare 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 for 15 minutes or 10 minutes with your eyes open obviously you blink after a while you, you close your eyes and you'll see it right here mm -hmm. have you seen that mm -hmm. isn't it lovely with a candle the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With any face the same, you see it there. So then what are you training that inner purity to stay in your mind, that inner purity? So when things on the outside world disturb you, after practicing this a lot, see, the mantra is your ears. You'll hear the mantra and you will see only the divine form as you see it. That's why it's really important to stick to one thing when you meditate. Choose one thing and stick to it. People try, oh, I like this mantra, oh, I like this, oh, I like this. And they change, they get fickle, they don't have faith in what they're meditating on. So, of course, you can never get firm. Our master used to say, you know, people go to so many different gurus, so many different gurus, so many different gurus, so many different teachers, so many different... They are so confused because one guru will explain it one way. Another guru will explain it another way. Isn't that what happened to religions? They all say the same thing in their own language. One has a Chinese accent, one will say chi, one will say prana. Hey, what's the difference? It's the same thing. Do you understand? One will have an Indian accent, one will have an American accent, one will have an English accent. So words will be pronounced different. But it's the same thing. So a master said, once you find your path, stick with it. Dig deep. Dig deep and you will get into that well. It is your faith that will change the world. It is your faith that will make you see the divine. It is faith without doubt. Even a little doubt and you can't see it. So dig deep. Dig deep into your soul. Dig deep in your heart. Dig deep to one truth and follow. And you'll get water. Water will come out. You will get all the gifts. But it's our, you know, People are fickle. We run everywhere. I tell you, the, the, the one thing that had kept me safe is focusing on the master. The amount of people that asked me to go to all the different masters in the world. And I would go, I found my master. Stick with it. Practice Yama Niyama. <coughs> stick with Sri Patanjali. Stick with the Bhagavad Gita. You find your Gita. You find your Sri Patanjali. If, you may find the Bible. I don't know. Maybe some book may inspire you so much. You find what you want to find, then stick and go deep. Do it every day, every day. And people will try to confuse you. Oh, but this one, and go to that one, and go to... And then the mind will, yeah. And again distracted, same distraction, same story, same thing <laughs> again. Isn't it true? It's all the same. You know it? Stick, stick. Work with one thing. And in time, you get really strong. And that's one thing that helped me through this path. I just stuck to one path because it made sense, because it was so universally full of love. Everybody was accepted, you know, and it wasn't into the occult, learn and get you, develop your powers, and you can you know, see all these visions. It was so simple. Do good, be good. Yeah, it's true. Nowadays, everybody wants occult powers, powers, powers for what? To destroy other people? To destroy
destroy yourself, to get so involved in the powers that you think you're God's gift to the human race and forget that we're all the same and we're all one. You know what? We're all going to die and stay in a box in a coffin. Some will be cremated, some will be buried. What's the difference? Make ourselves so special with the powers. I tell you, don't ask for those things. Ask to just be good, do good, live a peaceful, peaceful, useful life. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your friends. Help your neighbors. Look, just good, simple thinking. You know, so peaceful. All these people go into a cult. They get into dangerous zones. They deal. Oh, they see demons. They see this. This. Oh, you know, they don't. They're not happy. <coughs> they're not happy. And I keep asking them. I've asked them myself. Are you at peace? Answer one question. <laughs> Do you have peace? And if you can't answer that. Why are you doing what you're doing? Right? Isn't it that simple? It is so simple. The truth is so simple. What's the point of doing anything at the end of the day if you come home so disturbed? Look for your peace. And it could be in music, it could be in painting, it could be in therapies, it could be, I don't know what your gifts are, in computers, you know. Everybody has their own gift. Photography, you know, the gifts give you a hint. Your gifts, cooking, <laughs> animals, they, your gifts, your natural gifts give you a hint of what you meant to do with those gifts. You need to make those gifts holy. That's your sign. You love to do something and you keep deferring it. But do that something, that gift, to serve everybody around you as well. Not only to feed yourself in your pocket. Yes? Um, Colin Hiles from Finding Your Smile has a, a way of explaining that which is really nice. <laughs> Please tell us. <coughs> he says that we all have our GPS, our built-in GPS. The G is for our gifts, the P is for what we're passionate about, and the S is for service to others. So you find your gift, you use it with passion to serve others, and that's your GPS. I love that. I love that. That's my GPS. I love that. Yeah. What was his name? Colin Hiles. It's finding your smile is the gift yeah. of the treats and things. Finding your smile. Your smile. Yeah. But it's so simple. It's like travel through it's life. It's so simple. GPS. That's your GPS. I love that. Thank you for sharing no, we don't that. Have GPS. And thank you, Colin. <laughs> what a wonderful thing. That is exactly it. That is your that is um that is your hint. That's your hint. Your gifts. And people have gifts. Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, how many times I've heard that. Do you know, it's not the people who are so perfect in their work that become successful. In fact, they, they're the worst. The people who are so fussy about perfectionist, they actually get stuck because they're so scared to produce in case it's not perfect. It's those that are just good and have the courage and take the risk and go out there. Those are the people who are successful. You take the risk without fear. And they're not the best. Many times I've talked to people who are very successful, and I said, what drives you? Is it the love for my work? And when they become successful, they share with others. Really wonderful, yes. Those two Ps really work against each other. Passion and perfection, in art at least. Yeah, now it depends. What I've understood from her, there's passion and there is passion. Is that, is that what you said? Perfect? Could you repeat that again? Maybe I didn't hear you clearly. Perfectionism in creation is an enemy. Yes, I do agree with that. Sorry, I didn't understand. That. Absolutely. It is an enemy. It stops many people in this life. Highly intelligent people, highly creative people have come to me crying because they want perfection and they're never happy with their, their imperfections. So thank you for bringing that in. That's absolutely true. And that kills the passion. It kills it. And they're really very, very troubled. And I've seen so many like that. So if you have a, a gift, use it with passion and then serve others with it. Share it, share it, share it. Because the more you share, the more it multiplies. Look at Lord Jesus. That's the story of the loaves and the fishes.
That's what it symbolizes. When you share, it multiplies. Always multiplies. We always have enough, don't we, Shanti? Wherever we go. Always. Hmm? Oh, if we don't, always. we get more than there and then. <laughs> you know, sometimes I go to places and I expect 12 people to attend the talk in Finland. And we had 42. And I only brought like, oh my God, this small pile of cards. But I had given some to Shanti and I had given some to Ulla. And we had all just enough, just enough. <laughs> <laughs> to everyone. Every time, it, it's really quite incredible how this happens. So I don't know how it happens. You know, I've traveled all over the world. I, money grows in my face. I promise you. It just, I, I don't know how to explain it. It just grows. It's like when you, you know, haven't you noticed sometimes when you're very peaceful and very calm, and time actually waits for you, you know? It waits for you. I only have 10 minutes to go from here to there. And you stop and you do one thing and you do two things, you know, oh, you got there and one minute before mm -hmm. time. How did that happen? Because you were so quiet, you were so peaceful, that every, it's almost like time works for you. But when you're rushing, God forbid, time works against you. <laughs> Can we talk about being in the now, being in the moment, right? When you are in the moment, that moment warps, time warps. It does warp. When you're not in the moment, mm -mm. It goes really too quick. So thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing that. So, and after that, when you practice Pratyahara, bringing the senses inwards to the pure light within you, the guru within, the light within, then follows supreme, supreme mastery over the senses. Then your mouth will say, I want this. Today I don't feel like it's not good for me. I'm not going to have it. Tomorrow, when your mouth wants it, mm, today it's going to be delicious and I'm going to really enjoy it. So I'm going to enjoy it. Offer it to the divine. You know, my father used to say that everything you put in your mouth, offer to the divine. Offer to God. Offer to God. And if you think that way, then you can't overdo. You're not allowed to overdo because you're thinking, oh, balance. God is balanced. This is enough. Now I had enough. You know, offer to God. It's really good practice. I love that practice. Offer everything. You know, in fact, our, our master also used to tell us, he's really with me today. He seemed to talk about it a lot today. He used to tell us, you know, when you're taking a bath in the morning, instead of oh, da, 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 think, I'm washing the Lord's body. I'm washing the Lord's hair. Because really, this is a gift. Right? This is not ours, right? All this is a gift. So, while it's a gift, who gave it to you? It's the Lord. Where is the Lord sitting? In your heart. So you have to look after the temple. It's a really good practice. And you know, Amaked, who is one of our Guru's really great disciples, she's beautiful, she's Italian. And uh, she traveled with him many places all over the world. Yeah, you met her. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. You know what she's doing now? The last few years since he's passed, she's only looking after her husband. She's such a devoted yogi. She loves looking. He used to be left, I think, Alzheimer's. And she's just loving to look after him. And this is a woman of high intelligence. High intelligence. So much love to give. Such an incredible lady. And I went to see her. She won't leave her husband's side. And no complaining. Five years. Wow. You know, you really have to give it to some people. They really have some kind of godly strength that I... You know, I deeply admire. So incredible. Anyway, I'm a kid. What was my point? What's that good? Oh, she used to tell me, you know, because she loves oh, makeup. She, yeah, she loves, she, she's very beautiful. She loves makeup. And she took, you know, she actually, I was sitting with her and Gurudev having lunch. He said, you know, Gurudev, every day when I put on my makeup, I said, God is putting my eyeliner on. God is putting my blusher on. And especially my lipstick. Oh. Which is the first time laughing. God is kissing me. It was so funny. It just something that I never forgot, you know, that image of her telling the guru. And I thought, it's so pretty, do you know? It's, it's just so simply, so truthful. Whatever you have, whatever you wear, enjoy it all. And he laughed. And, you know, Gurudev would say, that's what? In other words, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And that is, um, and now how are we doing with time? Oh, we have time. 
So uh, next we, what's the, let's do the eight limbs of yoga, so you remember, heads up. <laughs> what's the first one? Yamas. Yamas. Forgotten already two weeks down the road. This is terrible. Let's start again. Yamas. Niyamas. together on a Saturday morning or tea in the afternoon and still talking rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. I was showing her all the notes I, when I came back from my Raj TT. You know, showing her some of the notes because I said I'll give you some of my notes on pranayama. But it, I don't think you can read my writing so I'm going to type it for you uh, this weekend and then send you my email to Kamala. And you know, I came back and continued studying, writing my own notes. So this didn't happen up on Pranayama. I did my own practice, write my own notes. Where is it benefiting me? Keeping in check what was going on inside of me all the time while I was studying. But you know nowadays, I give people a course, they do it really well, and then get the finish. They don't continue studying on their own. They don't continue practicing on their own. You got to. You gotta keep going with it. Practicing, practicing, practicing. Every day, every day. Without a break. And with all your heart. You see, Sri Patanjali really knew it, didn't he? <laughs> and you notice that anything you do in life, from being an artist to a musician, if you practice for a long time, or a doctor or an IT expert, if you do it for a long time, without yeah. a break, and all your heart, you become good at it. You just become good at it. Anything you do for a long time, a therapist, anything you do, with all your heart, you become great. So follow that. Hmm? So let's, next, let's go to Dharana. Can somebody read it's Sutra 1, Book 3, page 171. Book 3 is Vibhuti Pada. The benefits you get from this practice. Vibhuti is, means ashes. Hmm? Vibhuti means ashes. Can you all say Vibhuti? Vibhuti. Yeah, it means ashes. When something burns, <coughs> right, what is left? Ashes. ashes. So when we work with this, all these five limbs of yoga, up to Prachahara, what happens? All the negative in our minds and in our emotions eventually burns into ashes and becomes holy ash. We call the Buddha holy ash. And then you become holy. And then your third eye, that's why they put it there, opens. That means you're more aware. You open your sixth sense. You become in tune with all the different elements. You become awake. And that's what it means. That is your gift. What more do you want than that great gift? So, who's going to read this next picture? Thank you, Terry. Arana is the binding of the mind to one place, object, or idea. Now, this I basically said earlier about, you know, choose an item, one object, one idea, you know, whatever you, one place. Keep the same place every day if you can, if you can, if you can. Make a little temple at home for those who don't have one. Make any small corner. I started with a little footstool, which I decorated. <laughs> this big, because I didn't have one space, because my apartment at that time was too mm -hmm. tiny. But look, God's given me so many temples now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so you make your own space, and you, whatever it is, and that's your corner. That's a really good place to start. Because <coughs> why? The same place every day. You put energy into it. You put energy into that place, your energy every time. Actually, you know, our master told us that we should, it's really nice to use an asan. As, asan is a square piece of cloth made with either silk, anything natural, wool, or linen, anything natural fabric, because it's a great conductor of energy. 
Hmm? All the synthetics are not great conductors of energy. So if you use something like that, I mean, here Mary has given us this asan. It's a big one. It's a nice one that's really cushioned. You could call this an asan. This is a big one. But I started with a small square wooden <coughs> cloth that I bought in India. And you sit on it every day, every day, every day. What happens? It reminds you what you have to do. You just get, it's like a bed, right? You go to bed and you feel sleepy. It's just practical knowledge, right? Practical. And um, so this is an asan. I used to have one square one. I used to, for the first 15 years, I used to travel everywhere with it. Now I don't travel with anything. My asan is everywhere. You see, in time, you already build up your own natural energy. In the early days, I couldn't travel without my arm cushion and my arm asan. Do you remember the pink one, which I still have in my room? But um, this is just to tell you. And then you make a little temple, however you like it. You make a little, put a little candle, put whatever you like, whatever means something to you. And then you put some flowers, which is really nice, and offer it. And then you sit down, you stare at the candle. Stare, stare, stare. Chant if you like. Find your own way. I always like people to find their own way. You know? You find your own sincere prayer. What feels right for you? You know, everybody comes with their own traditions and their own religions or basic backgrounds. So for you, you know, if uh, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy means something, do you do that? You know, Om Mani Padmi Ham, which is a Buddhist chant, if that means something, do you do that? Om Namah Shivaya means something, do that. You know, find what really, that's the first thing you need to do to make your meditation really intact. Our master suggested to many people to use the yantra. Why? So universal. Truth is one. Pass of many. many. Let us live in peace, peace and joy. joy. Truth peace is one. Pass of many. many. Let, Let us live in love and light. That's the whole meaning of it. And of course, now you know, you know, if you study now metaphysics, and you go to the great physicist or are people who are trying to make sense of this God through using mathematics, they always speak about the two triangles. Do you see the center? Mm -hmm. One going down, one going up, the part that looks like uh, the Jewish uh, Star of David. Mm -hmm. They all explain it in these two. Find out yourself. Um, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. It's very exciting. Scientists are now trying to find the black hole is not the black hole. Ole has a very good DVD on it. Really interesting. Ask him about it. Really interesting. And uh, he could maybe pass you the, the website where you can get it. You know, what they're discovering, discovering now. It's what the yogi said for so long. And it's all being discovered. It's really quite exciting, scientifically. And there's the forms. And if you look in Catholic churches and those traditions, you will see all these symbols of yantras. You look petals and flowers. Each master, or the Buddhists call it mandalas, you know? Each tradition carries their own connection to that divine center. Bring you inwards. Bring you inwards. So, Dharana is the binding of the mind to one place, one object, or one idea. And next we will go to Diana. Who can read it, please? Would you like to read it? Yeah. Come here and then read it. <laughs> it's a difficult one to read, but I'm sure you can. Diana is a I think you're brilliant. Cognition. Dhyana is the continuous flow of cognition. <laughs> <laughs> Explains it. I like the, the way he explains it. 
The Hindu scriptures give a beautiful example of this continuous flow. They say it is like pouring oil from one pot into another. It is a continuous string. It doesn't break. The mind is fixed. Communication between meditator and object of meditation is steady. After a long practice of dharana, gradually the flow of cognition, being with it, gets a little longer and it becomes dhyana. <coughs> when would you know that you have really meditated? There are some signs for that. Say you come and sit for meditation at 4.30 a.m. How many of you do that? <laughs> <laughs> no need to go so early. Meditation is assigned for an hour. The bell rings at 5.30. If you feel, what? Who rang the bell so soon? I just sat down five minutes ago. Then you may have been meditating. But when you feel five minutes as one hour, you are not meditating. You are still concentrating. Time has no meaning in meditation, and space is also lost. You don't know where you are. If you break that meditation, all of a sudden, you may wonder, what happened to my body? Even the body is forgotten in real meditation. You are above time and space, and you are out of your body. When I say out of the body, don't think that I mean that you are traveling in space or anything like that. I mean, the mind transcends body consciousness. In this sense, meditation is similar to sleep. You don't know you have a body. Even though you still have it, you don't know it. If your sleep is really deep and someone comes and takes your body somewhere else, you <laughs> don't even know. When you wake up, you will say, I was sleeping on the couch. Who brought me to the bed? There are some signs of meditation also. In the beginning, you feel so light. Sometimes you get beautiful visions. Something beautiful and elevating. Sometimes you won't see visions. You will simply see beautiful light. You will seem to be bathed in beautiful moonlight. Or sometimes you may just hear beautiful sounds like the roaring of the ocean, the sound of a gong, or beautiful notes of a flute. These are various signs you may come across. Normally, I don't say these things much, because once you hear that, you may imagine it. You may imagine it is happening to you. Instead, it should just happen now. <coughs> So when people come and they meditate, they do start to hear things. Just nice signs. Don't get attached to them. It's nice signs. It's like, oh, I'm on my way. Yes, I'm on my way. Well, somebody had some lovely sounds the other day. He came to see me in Gibraltar. And he said, oh, I had such a lovely experience. And every day I'm waiting for it. I said, don't wait. <laughs> I'll never come. You're expecting it. Do you see? It has to happen by its side. Now that you're waiting for it, and you say to me, at the same time, your meditation is not the same. You know why it's not the same? Because you're waiting for it. You see, it's it's a really it's a mind game. So just you had a good, thank you, let it go. And then you don't know when the next one is going to happen. You don't expect anything. It may not happen. I don't know. But the expectation stops the meditation. So you're thinking, you want to come again, come again, can I make it happen again? And then you're not meditating. It's what? Another desire. That's all it is. You built up another desire. Our master used to say, say to us, if you change a steel cage for a gold cage, it's still it's a, a cage. cage. You want to be free. And that's what I kept saying throughout my practice. No, 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 you're getting into a gold cage now. Still the cage. You need to fly. That's what you need to do. No boxes, no fixed ideas. God is everywhere. 
God is everywhere. No fixed ideas of what should be or shouldn't be. Every time you get caught up in fixed ideas, you stay stuck and you can't grow. And God is everywhere. And people will tell you to conform to fixed ideas. You're so scared to move on to something bigger, greater, better. Stick to the old way, it's safe. Is it really safe? Or are you locking yourself in a cupboard there? Hmm? Are we all really safe? No one is safe. We're only safe when we leave, leave, leave this body, really. When we have this body, nobody is safe, right? Anything can happen at any time, isn't it true? Anything can happen at any time. So seek security in the divine light, and not security on this world. It will disappoint you over and over and over again. One day you have everything, next day you have nothing. One day you have a lot of friends, next day you have a lot of enemies. So fix your attention on that highest light. And then let things come, let them go. In your meditation, do the same. When you're concentrating, many thoughts will come. Let it come, let it go. Let it come, let it go. Like the oil from one part to the other. Don't stop it and say, oops, and then you break the flow. Once it's flowing, let it flow. And that's when you should allow yourself to let it flow. And next we'll go to the samadhi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Samadhi is the same meditation when there is the shining of the object alone as if devoid of form. <clears throat> now there is no more form. There's nothing anymore. And now this one, and I'm going to read to you because this one, you cannot talk about something like that. It's an experience. It's an experience. When you're in samadhi, it's no longer talkable. I mean, we try to talk, and we try to put it in words, and we try to say things, but none of the words can give the feeling of samadhi. So, um, there is, here's what Gurudev says, there's not much I can say about this one. You will easily understand when you have a little experience. Meditation culminates in the state of samadhi. It's not that you practice samadhi. Nobody can consciously practice samadhi, which is enlightenment. Nobody can consciously do that. Did you hear that? Our effort is there only up to meditation. Put all your effort in dharana. It becomes effortless in dhyana. And you are just there, knowing that you are in meditation. But in samadhi, you don't even know that. You are not there to know it because you are that. You think first with a lot of interruptions, and that is dhyana. Then when you become what you think. Did you feel that? You become what you think. That is why it's so important, yama niyama. You become what you think. Um, that is samadhi. In meditation, you have three things. Meditator, the meditation, and the object. Right? There's three things happening there. In samadhi, there is neither the object or the meditator. There's no feeling of, I am meditating on that. And here he gives a wonderful uh, ex uh, example. To give a scientific analogy, if you keep on adding drops of an alkaline solution to an acid, at one point the solution becomes alkaline. At that point you are simply added, adding alkali to alkali. There's no more acid there. The giver and the receiver become one. And that's when you become the instrument of peace. What is St. Francis' prayer? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. 
Where there is darkness, let me bring light. Where there is injury, your pardon. Let, you know, did she sing it again? Of course she can sing it again. Shanti, please come. <laughs> Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair in life, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. Oh, Master, grant that I may never see. So much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in pardoning that we are part. becomes firmly grounded when done for a long time without, without a break, break and with all of your heart. So she sings at all the satsangs now. When we were in Finland and Sweden, everybody was so happy to hear her sing. It just shows what you can do when you really have a passion in that way, a gift. Well, she, in this case, she didn't have a gift. <laughs> You know, people are so worried about this problem. Use your creative gifts. Even if it's not a gift, it's a passion. Go through it. Go through it. You know, grants desires and liberation. Hmm? Grants desires and liberation. You know, she had such a desire to, to sing, which drove everybody a little crazy in the beginning. <laughs> 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 And she's so kind to let us use it because this is, I'm sure this is why God put her here to show us what can be accomplished. And then she had this desire to be famous. Into her head. Just one year of voice lessons and I can be famous now. Do you see the ego also? So she went and joined the wow factor. That's <laughs> terrible. She showed us the video it was horrible. <laughs> And I, go, and I told her, like, why are you doing this to yourself? And why are you going through allowing people to ridicule you? But then she lost that desire for fame. Because she was so evil, was so bashed. Right? Now look at this is how we, we work. This is you know, this is her in singing. But many people work the same way with other things in their lives. And her ego was so bashed. Because, you know, me on top of, oh, it was horrible. I won't lie and say it's nice if I don't think it is. I think you really insult a person by lying, you know, and somebody so close. And anyway, you could see the face of everybody who saw that. <laughs> 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 That she lost the desire.
desire to be famous. Do you see that? She said, she actually came to me and said, you know, Melanie, I, I lost my peace because of this desire to be famous, and now I look at that and I feel horrible. I don't want to be famous anymore. He said, great. Now the motive is different. The motive is different. And now, she is, the motive is different. So she sang for the sake of it. And then, of course, Razmi used to come with us all the time, so Razmi used to sing. So she said, oh, I need a singer. Okay, Melanie, I'll practice this song. I'll practice this song. Can you practice Let It Be for me, please? So she practiced that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the lyrics of that? Yeah, she practiced that for me. She sang that in Finland for me. And now she was using it for a different purpose. Not to be famous, to help me out. And to help everybody out by singing the words. And, like you said, now she is. See, when you drop the desire, it's given to you. Cause, and she put in the hard work. She still went to her music lessons every Thursday, but she still had the passion to sing. But what she lost was this, I want to be famous. And I used to scold her all the time. So you're only around me, you're using it because you want to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> honest, honest. That was the truth. She's and destined to sing these songs, you know. So when she sang that to a crowd which they were expecting totally different songs, it kind of, oh, yeah. it was even more of a shock, you know. Yeah. But now she's learned discrimination, what to sing where. You know, you sing Shanti, it's you know, we all love her so much, you know. That's why I say everywhere we go she gives us such a com you know, comic relief and such <laughs> genuine purity, love of mm. heart for people, such genuineness, you know, she is so genuine and so pure inside, so pure inside, and she's worked towards that, why? Because she left, she became, she did prachahara, she brought these senses within to look for the light, and she stuck to one thing, one thing, one thing, the fame came, she got disturbed, she couldn't sleep, she saw, she said, I don't want this, it makes me lose my peace, Bye. To that one thing. And she did something else that gave her fame, made her suffer a lot. She called me, huh? Never been so agitated. Go back to the simple <laughs> practice. She went back to the simple practice. You see, always back to the simple practice. Just peace. And then you learn that those outside things actually drown you. They don't make you happy. They drown you. But she had to go there, past that, to realize it. And then to accept and laugh at herself. Which is the greatest gift of all, the detachment, the detachment, it's a detachment, you know, to what she was in the past. It's a total detachment, that's why we all love with her, because she really feels no attachment to that. And that is freedom, there's no more cages there. Using your time for valuable stuff, rather than wasting it away, you know, on such nonsense all the time. Why do you have so much time anyway? I love some of your time. <laughs> There's so much to do in this world. How can anybody be bored? You know, so much work to do. You just have to go there and, and just see it. So this is um, book three, and this is the last of the... Um, please read all these. So trust these are the last of this section of the eight limbs of yoga. Next week, we will be studying, we'll go back to book one, and we will be doing the four locks and keys next week. So, um, are there any questions? Anything you want to ask? Yes. Um, I was just, I probably might seem a strange question, but I've been thinking of writers at ask. You know the way everything is in the diction, really, and you're saying, you know, when, you know, obviously, Listening to singing is an addiction, reading books is an addiction. I mean, they're all addictions. And you say, in meditation, you know, you want to see the, whatever, the voices addictions, and whatever. Yeah. They're addictions. Yeah, exactly. Would you go so far as to say that meditation is an addiction? It can be. Yeah. Yeah. It can be. I have seen people so addicted to meditation that they forget about their duties and their life. You know, we are here on earth. I've told many yoga teachers this, and I use the Buddhist story 
You know, there was this Buddhist disciple, and he goes to his master, and he goes, Master, Master, when can I reach enlightenment? He said, well, if you meditate like this, you know, two hours every day, four hours every day, you know, in four <coughs> years, you will be enlightened. Okay, so he goes home, very happy with that. And then he goes home, and mine goes, but if I meditate for eight years, oh my God, half the time. And so he goes to his master, 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 you know, if I meditate eight hours every day, when will I reach enlightenment? Twenty years. <laughs> and he goes, master, why? If you'll be so busy meditating, you won't be doing your duty. Do you see? So there are many people who do. I have seen that. And they get so angry in their meditation. Somebody disturbs. You know, many of my students, they have children, they have family. They scream at the children. What example are you giving your children? Don't disturb me, I'm meditating. Hurry, hurry, eat your breakfast so I can meditate. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is what a lot of people are doing. They become addicted to it, that they've lost even the meaning of it. I know, but when you drop everything, you're just, and you're, you're kind of bringing back the sense and you drop everything the whole way you know, <coughs> all the addiction can't you just drop the meditation as well <laughs> I know that sounds weird no it's not weird that's when you come to samadhi yeah that's, that's what I think that's, that's right yeah. correct yeah. when you drop it all that's samadhi and you're in a different place totally yes absolutely you drop that as well mm -hmm. That's what our master used to say, when you have visions, you know, drop that because you'll be attached to that. There are still temptations, there's still desires, there's still, they're great, they're good, but they still stop you from reaching everything. Because you're looking for that one thing. Do you see? Yes, correct. It's a very, very sensible statement. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes. The story about the water. Oh, about thieving, yes. Thank you for reminding me. I, I don't know if I've told you this story, but I'll tell it again for Monica. I think she missed it. Um, there was this um, milkman, and he made mm. delicious mm. milk. I told you, but yeah. would you mind if I tell it again? <laughs> yeah. So every day he used to get delicious milk, go with the boatman across the river, and sell this milk to the villagers. Of course, over time, they loved his milk, but he had the same amount of cows. And he had no more milk, and he knew he could sell much, much more. So he went back to his village, and he thought, what could I do? They all trust me now. You know what I'll do? I'll double the quantity. I'll put half milk, half water. And of course, he would take this half milk, half water to the village and sell it. But because they trusted him for so many years, they didn't even question him. So one day, he was going back home. And, uh, and it was really stormy and rainy and it crossed the river. So, you know in India in those days, you know, you put your money in handkerchiefs. Have you seen it? In the old days, they didn't use purses. They put the money inside to make a knot. Have you seen mm -hmm. it? Oh, it's really nice. They still do it in some villages, yeah? And my mother always does it. My mother still does it. She takes all, you know, we give prayer room money. I mean, we give money in our prayer room at home to give to the poor every day. All the family does. And then they tie it in this handkerchief. So anyway, he took half the money, tied it on a handkerchief, and then tied it to his waist. Other half the money, tied it, tied it to his waist. And he went on the boat, and it was really rough, really rough. All of a sudden, this huge wave comes over the boat. And of course, you know, water is so powerful, the knot, just half the money went. He goes, my money, my money. So when they got to the shore, the boatman looked at him and said, Water money went to the water. <laughs> milk money went to the milk. <laughs> so, money used badly will not bring good results. Will not bring. You may think it does. It will not bring. Long term, it will not bring. Everything you do has an opposite and equal reaction. See, what he did give, the milk money, stayed with him. That was good, the milk, that stayed with him. The water money, where? All that extra work, all that lying, all that fuss, greed. But what does it benefit a man?
to gain the whole world and lose its soul. It doesn't benefit any of us. So sometimes it seems hard, it seems we have to sacrifice things, and it's not easy sometimes on this journey to peace. But stick with it. If it was so easy, it wouldn't be worth anything. Stick with it. Be brave. It's not always going to work out the way you want. In fact, many times it doesn't. Um, there's no reason. I just think it's all the learning, you know? I think it's all love. I think life is a movie. It's a play. Don't get stuck. You know, come out of it by repeating, you know, I'm not really this body. I'm really soul. Keep telling yourself, and one day, one day, one day, one day, it's osmosis. You will know you're not this body. You'll just get up and know it. You just get up and know it. Really know it. And then your entire life will be so different. So different. By itself, it will become different. You really don't have to do much. Just stick to the good of morals. Do good, be good, be kind, be compassionate, like Master Shivananda said. So can you help me sing that? So love, give, purify, meditate, realize. Do good, be good, be kind, and be compassionate. Inquire who might know thyself, and be free. Adapt, adjust, accommodate. Bear insult, bear injury, pious sadhana. D-I-N, D-I-N, D-I-N. Do it now, do it now, do it now. As Master Shivananda's song that he used to sing in his ashram, with his huge voice, strong voice, big man. Do it now. Don't wait. What are you waiting for? He would say. That's what he used to say. I had a cassette from him. What are you waiting for? Time is short. You are soul. You know? And that's, that's the voice we need to hear. Do it now. What are we waiting for? Don't worry so much about this world. Can you do it? Yes. Uh, I wonder if you are the sexy day thinks about something that uh, only when we are here on earth is when we are, we are able to evolve very quickly. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I, I just go with that three weeks on the road trying to understand it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to spend it a bit yeah. further. What happened? When, when you are here, then why is it not so quickly? You know? Okay, you know. This is like the university that has been given to us. Mm -hmm. This is where we have our senses. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, once you're on the other path, the lane, it takes a long time to evolve because the challenges aren't so great. Because when you're in the spirit world, you have a lot of help, but challenges are not so great, so you can take many hundred years to evolve. The earth is such school such a difficult, difficult school. It's the highest school of knowledge. That's why they say if you have three things, that you have a physical body, you have a, uh, a, 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 a you know, a theory or, or, or understanding of divine, and you have a guru or a teacher to lead you, it's the three luckiest things you have in the world. You've been given the best gifts because it is on earth where you really have the challenges and these challenges are so gross because it's so far away from our subtle body, our soul. Our soul is so light. So it's so hard. If you can do it here, you can progress very quickly. That's why many souls, when they reach the other side, they, you know, and they have to reincarnate. They take a long time to want to come down because it's so difficult. We must have taken a lot to come down again. Well, we chose this time because it's so difficult. Because if we overcome all the traumas and all, we can go to the next level and go directly to the divine energy. Lord Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. So uh, we can reach the next day. It's just like in school, isn't it? You've got first grade, second grade, third grade. And then you go to university. And then from university, you go to... Masters, and then you go to doctorate, right? 
So this is where we get our doctorate. We've all been given this gift to be able to go there. And, this, and really, the earth is not an easy place. That's why when we come to earth, we forget the memories of our soul. Because if we remembered our memories, then we want to be here. <laughs> we don't want to be here. It was very difficult to want to be here when you have memories because you know how happy you were. But we have karmic debts. We have karmic debts. You know, uh, we chose. You know, through a lovely book, whimsy. Maybe I should bring it next week and show them how, how these little drops from God. You know, it's lovely pictures. I'll I'll show it to you. The journey of the souls. Choose. They wear which costume they want to experience. You know, here we can touch, feel, enjoy something. It's just our senses get carried away, so we've forgotten. In the early days, I mean, if you read the Hindu scriptures, man used to communicate with God all the time, all the time. Talk, communicate. We've lost that because we got so outside, and we've become so dense, so material, so greedy, and we've forgotten. That's why we can't communicate. But we can communicate if we practice all the yamas and niyamas. That's why for me that's the most important teaching. Non-violence, truthfulness, <coughs> non-stealing, non-greed, study of spiritual books. These are the things we can do every day. Practice purity, do good, be good, serve one, serve all. Hmm? So this is where we grow very quickly. We can still grow in the spiritual world, but much longer. Challenge is greater. You always get the best student. The highest challenge, don't you? Even in school. The teacher will choose the best student to go in for the competition. The most difficult competition. Won't choose one that's not bothered. Will they? Choose one that's got the strength, the stamina to go forward. Always in life. You would as well. Hmm? So it's the same thing, you see? Yes, it is true. This is where we can really elevate ourselves. And it's also very easy to fall. But you know, after you reach a certain level in your spiritual growth in the spiritual world, after you reach a certain level, you don't have to worry. When you come back and you're going to fall, you are saved. I have seen this. I've seen many people who are born very spiritual, spiritual backgrounds, and then they go all the wrong way, drugs, whatever. Uh, they go into all kinds of horrible behavior. And then, but because they have that that, that inner call, that they get a depression, or they get something really bad happen to them, and they walk into my office, and I don't know why they will walk into a spiritual teacher when they don't even know much about spirit. And they walk in, and they go, oh my God, that person really has been saved, must have done something really good in a pre previous life. <coughs> because that's their awakening to their soul, they're reminded. It's just some karma they had to do and finish. Hmm? And then they come to that point. They come to that point. There's some karma. And then after that, it's finished. So yeah, this is a really good place to be, to grow. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> and if not, meditate on it. No, to, to, to grow, if we are accepting, and you know that already, what? You know it already? Yeah. So why suffering? <coughs> Great! So now continue your, your journey and serve others. That's the next journey. We fix ourselves and then we serve others. Absolutely. And help more souls to be reminded who they are and that they're all such a Dananda. Do you know many people who know that there is such a Dananda in this world? <laughs> Do you know many? Very few. Bhagavad Gita says, millions come to my path. Only a handful. Lord Jesus says, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Most people follow like sheep to the ways of the world and greed. So we want to be useful? We awaken every soul with love. It's the only way you can awaken them. You don't awaken them, oh, you have to learn. No. I get very angry when my students force yoga down somebody else's throat. You don't have that right. You really do not have that right. If you want to force yoga down anybody's throat, you give them love. You give them kindness. 
And if they want to come and learn more, the soul will bring them. And this is the way to teach, by example. By example. Never force anybody into anything. And this is our journey. Once you've got the truth, share it. You know? And people who are really, sometimes, you know, in the early days, I remember when I started knowing this, you know what I would do? My husband used to love, after work, going into the pub. He used to go into the pub every day. You know what I did? I went with him. I didn't like all the smelly cigarettes, smelly, you know, for me it was smelly, you know? But I went there every day. And you know the amount of people ask me about yoga because I didn't force it down their throat. Do you remember Lavina? I used to go to, uh, what was the name of that bar? I don't even remember. Oh, that's 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 Roll carpet. That's, you see, she remembers. <coughs> With all your family yeah. members. And do and you know the amount of men that asked me about you was quite something. Plant a seed at a place where they were comfortable. If I put them to my territory, they're not so comfortable. And now all of them, when they have something, my husband's friends call me and ask me about God. Isn't it lovely? They may not come to the talks, but they'll ask me when they have a problem. Quietly, on the side. That's their way. It's okay. But a reminder mm -hmm. of who they are inside. That's all we do. You got the knowledge? Remind people. I just felt the little seed in gentleness and kindness. By your example. You know how many people say Devamani looks so peaceful these days, you know? She's so beautiful. I want what she has. You know? And this is what happens to people. I want what she has. And then that's how you awaken them to their soul. That's the only way you can. Everything else is just talking, false words. So much knowledge for what? What touches souls is your energy, is your love, is your kindness. It's like I said, when you're picking up that animal or that broken soul, what are you doing? You're loving them. And love is God. And that's so hard to do. Because we're so based on I, me, and I. We're brought up in this generation. How much money are you going to make? What profession are you going to make? How famous are you going to be? You know, you want power, 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 power. That's the way we're brought up. It's all wrong. And that's what we awaken people. You know you can be happy. <laughs> you know it's fun just to sit and have a good laugh or do nothing together. You know? 